Okay, so welcome. Yeah, welcome along to Culture Night at the Dublin Buddhist Centre online. And um, yeah, we've had some, um, some great events so far um, this afternoon, this evening. So uh, Vajra Shura at four o'clock um, taught people the mindfulness of breathing. And then at 5.30, Mike Trakai taught the Metta Bhavana. And just um, uh, at seven o'clock, we had a conversation with myself and uh, three other order members who've um, produced a new Buddhist zine, born of, born of Fire and the Void. And now I'm here with uh, Dai Sagra, and I'll introduce him in a moment. And we're going to be talking about um, Buddhism and the Western artistic tradition. And the, the title of the evening is called Bach, Beckett, and the Buddha. And what we'll do is we'll talk for a while. Um, we'll talk probably for about 45 minutes. And then there'll be an opportunity towards the end to ask questions. So you, you'll notice your chat box, um, nothing will be coming up in your chat box, but you can um, fire off questions and Daniel will collect those questions and feed them through to me at the end and, we'll, and we can address them then. So you can, um, you can still fire off questions um, if anything occurs to you as we're talking, if you'd like to hear more about something uh, or you'd like to follow something up <clears throat> and we'll do that towards the end. So that we're scheduled to finish at 9.30. Um, so I just wanted, yeah, just, uh, and this, yeah, this, this, this is a, a, the idea is it's an informal conversation, it's not an interview as such. So I just want to introduce you to Dai Sagra, those of you who don't know him. So yeah, as you've heard, um, Dai Sagra is originally from Westmeath, and he attended University College Dublin, where he received a Master's of, Master of Art in Modern English and American Literature. He's had a long career in journalism and broadcasting, where he worked for RTE, and uh, he lived on the continent for much of that time. So he was ordained in 2018 and given the name Diasagra, which means Ocean of Kindness. So Diasagra, just to tell us a little bit about how you're- do I, do I get to introduce you first? Yeah, go ahead, go on, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'm in, I'm in a particular mode here, I need to kind of chill yeah, out. Yeah, no, I, 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 you need curbing, you need curbing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yanadara, uh, no, you're self-effacing as always. Yanadara, born and grew up in New Zealand, became involved with Buddhism in, and with our order in Wellington uh, while still in his teens. His adult life, though, has been spent in these islands, first in the UK and then, and mostly, to our great good fortune. Uh, in Ireland. He has stayed here, he's devoted his life, his adult life has been devoted to Buddhism, not only to his own practice, but to making the Buddhist path available to others. He's chairman of Dublin Buddhist Centre. How he and I find ourselves having this conversation, I suppose, is because we do find ourselves, when we get to talk, he's a busy man, um, we talk obviously about our Buddhist lives and the way that Buddhists do, uh, but we do find ourselves snatching the odd conversation about Benjamin Britten, uh, a, share, a deep shared interest in music, um, Benjamin Britten in particular in his case. He's a musician and I am not, and that is important for everything that follows. He has a diploma in music, but he doesn't. An advanced uh, diploma, I'll have you know, just for the record. I, I beg your pardon? It's an advanced diploma, I'll have you know, just for the record. Sorry, doctor. <laughs> uh, but he, I, he, he doesn't generally let that come between us. He also loves poetry, I know, and when he teaches the Dharma, you're quite likely to find him straying into Wordsworth, which I, I think you'd agree, Yanadara is very much in the spirit of our order. And it's an area in which he has great cred, as you're about to find out. Now you can, please. Oh, oh that was very generous. Oh. <laughs> very generous, thank you, Dwight Sagra. <laughs> now, can I ask you a question now, am I allowed? I think I can fit one in, yes. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm just interested to hear, you know, how you first got involved, or how you first got interested in what we are gonna have to call the arts in this um, conversation. So how did that come about? Um, I th it, it happened in my teens, uh, as it does for many people, I suppose. Uh, I was in boarding school and there was a twofold influence. There was a boy in the class who joined our year sort of halfway through and who was, he was the class intellectual. 
mm. and the competitive streak in me. There's nothing, there was nothing very um, inspired about this at the time. It was just circumstances. He was the class intellectual and uh, the competitive streak in me uh, demanded that I match him as an intellectual, which I wasted a great deal of my life trying to do because I couldn't then or now. Uh, the second more sort of deeper influence, I think, uh, and uh, the one I, I go back to with more, more pride, I suppose, mm. is um, very, a very specific occasion. We were lucky in school. There was a scheme at that time to bring uh, performing artists to perform to play for us. The school paid half the fee, as, as I recall, and an outfit called, I'll, I'll get it wrong, the Irish Music Association, I think it was called, paid, paid the other half. We had Charles Lynch. Charles Lynch, who was a world-class pianist, he played for Prokofiev. And, uh, he was, I think, the most distinguished instrumental musician we had at the time. Mm -hmm. And he came and he played Beethoven. And I remember, I remember, uh, vividly, a, a moment in Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata when I, I suddenly realized I was in the presence of something that I didn't understand that was completely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would have not been, I would not have been able to put these words on it then. But when I remember it now, it seemed like, it seems like I knew that this was something that I could spend my whole life going into and never get to the bottom of it. And I would have lost sight of that moment of inspiration up and on down the years. But mm. so that, 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 that was it. That was it. And was it a new, was it a was that an entirely new thing for you? Had you been touched by music before that, or did that come as a bolt out of the blue, as it were? It was a it was a complete bolt out of the blue. I grew up in a in a quite unmusical household. Yeah. To this day, I to this day I can't sing. I never learned. I tried to learn the piano, but I I never succeeded. Mm. It was beyond my ken. So it was it was and, far, it was sort of foreign to your to the atmosphere in which you grew up, but yet you had this, yeah yeah. And how did yeah. did you follow that up? How did you follow that up as a boy in a boarding school in Ireland? And... Um, I started to try to learn to play the piano, but again the competitive streak in me uh, put me off that because my my best friend at the time was the best pianist in the school and I was never going to be as good as him. So I, I beat a tactical retreat, which I've always regretted. Mm, interesting. Yeah. It's interesting that um, <clears throat> music, is, I, I, I sometimes think music, it, 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 it's incredibly competitive as an art form. Yeah. It, it, it does, because I, I, you know, like I do have a background in music and I always remember the pain of the comparison in a way, there's always somebody better than you. And um, we might get onto the talking this a bit, about this a little bit later on in terms of Mozart, but the gifts are so inequitably distributed, with, particularly with music. Some people just seem to be amazing at it with very little effort. And I don't think there is any getting away from that, mm. really. Yeah. Uh, because the idea of excellence, not of competition, but of excellence, mm. is so much part of the Western tradition and is so much one of its strengths. The idea of going further, doing better, uh, out of building on what was done before mm. in, in every way, in terms of expression, of course, in terms of the truth of what you're doing, which is what it's all about, really. But at, at every level, in terms of technique, uh, today's pianists can play stuff that uh, would have been deemed impossible 100 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and they toss off stuff that was unthinkable when right. Liszt played it for the first time. Uh, and it's, it's always that going further. And it's very cruel. It, it, as you know, you, mean, you, you would have come across this. It, it yeah. destroys people. People break under that yeah. pressure. That's the kind of shadow, I suppose, isn't it, of that? It's that, um, you know, some people, yes, some people, I mean, you know, like I, I, I remember, I mean, I was at music college and it'd be, it'd be sometimes it'd be torture, you know. Yeah. You'd, you'd work and work and work and then somebody would just kind of roll in and just, you know, 
<laughs> just yeah. and I and I've met the uh, the pianist who didn't make it to the end of the course in Vienna, oh. and uh, and I could tell you the name of the pianist who is a world star now who did, yeah, and. I know the difference between my friend and him is just that much. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. tiny. It's tiny. Yeah, yeah. I suppose in some ways is a bit, you know, like when we're talking about this, the resonances or affinities between Buddhism and, and music, and I suppose that's a, that's a definite affinity, isn't it? That maybe not so much the kind of, um, that the, there is a definite sense that there, you can become more through, through effort through practice, and we use that word. I'm yeah. really struck by that when I came across Buddhism because that word practice meant something to me already um, because I had a music practice and the, the idea that you had to put an effort to, 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 to develop your skill and being creative was a very- spending, cool. spending 50 minutes on the mat yeah. every morning, morning after morning mm. has there are parallels between that and playing your scales. Yeah. Having state of mind is very different. Yeah. But it's it, it's uh, how we could probably push this a little further, couldn't we? It's uh, it's changing oneself. Uh, the med the 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 pra practicing the scales is ch is training your unconscious muscular and nervous responses yeah. so that they are able for anything yeah. isn't that it isn't that it yeah. so that when you call I think when, that, when, when a particular technique is called for you yeah. can it flows naturally yeah 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 it's a bit like i mean i often i mean i i, I mean because when i when i study music i study jazz and that, that's what it's all about it's about it's a bit like because it's an improv improvised music, you're, you're trying to develop the language that you're going to need in order to respond to what somebody else, as it were, says a little bit. And I, I often find um, quite a neat parallel with, with study groups. You know, in Sri Ratna, we have study groups. We sit around, we talk about the Dharma, and somehow through the, through the conversation, something emerges, which um, none of us knew before, um, and it emerges in that conversation. So I think I, for me, that's, um, that's the metaphor for me of a, of a good study group is like a really, really good uh, jazz gig where, where everybody's communicating and, and listening very, very deeply and trying to find something new. Um, Miles Davis always used to say, um, well, I don't know if he always used to say it, but he, and he's reported to saying on at least one occasion, he said, don't, don't play what falls under your fingers. He probably said, don't play what falls under your fingers. <laughs> Yeah. But um, and he, there's probably a few curse words in there as well, which I won't repeat. But but yeah, but the, but that idea that you're you're trying you're looking for something that hasn't been uncovered before, something that hasn't been. Um, yeah, and there's also something, isn't there, about the ease with which things happen when they are ready to happen. You see a really great singer, but particularly if you're if you're lucky enough, as I have been, to to meet some of the great people and oh, yeah. to see that to see that they are living human beings right. yeah. um, uh, and very very ordinary people uh, they who spend their weekends watching the motor racing on the television they've been what, what difference does that make you know what difference does it make to meet maybe you could drop a few names <laughs> uh, I met Placido Domingo a couple of times right um, so maybe you could say who Placido Domingo is because not everyone is an opera lover Placido Domingo for the the greatest tenor of the second half of the 20th century. Wow. Um, Pavarotti fans will get me for this, but the greatest artist, the greatest musician tenor mm. um, of the second half of the 20th century, of whom I was in awe mm. uh, from, my, from my teens, from very soon after Charles Lynch. Um, mm. that, that was something about a heroic, he, that he was just coming into his uh, first full flowering, singing leading roles at the Met mm. when I was discovering opera in the late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a quite, quite mixed up and quite diffident young man at 
that age, there was something about the heroic tenor that, that filled a need. There was a, there was a draw yeah. there. So he became part of my mythology, really. He was a mythological yeah. figure. And it was sort of accidental, I suppose, that as years went by, he became recognized as the, as the great musical artist mm. that he is. I'm not claim, claiming to have discovered him or, or anything yeah. like that. Uh, but it just, it just fell out so. And when I finally met him, it, it was, it really was a case of meeting your heroes. Mm, yeah. And, and I was a little bit frightened of it. Of course, I was very frightened of it, actually. Um, and this is, um, this would be many, many years later. This would be about, uh, about 15 years ago now. Mm. So, uh, and immediately what struck me, uh, before he opened, before we even, we even shook hands, I saw him come through a door about 20 yards away, mm -hmm. the big hotel in Barcelona. And there was this sudden realization that this was just a bloke. Mm -hmm. It's just that guy. Mm -hmm. it was a, and, and the nature of his artistry became clear in, in a flash. He was, he was a guy who had done all the work. He'd done all the conscious study of the roles. He had trained the voice, the chest, the larynx, all the vocal equipment. All the work had been done so that singing at that level was for him the most natural thing in the yeah. world. Yeah. A bit, and, and that for me has uh, a very strong parallel with the kind of spiritual practice we're aiming for. Right. Uh, the spiritual practice that we're reaching the stage where it is impossible for us to act other than skillfully yeah impossible for us to feel other than skillfully act, think of it but it's quite it's quite an inspiring idea isn't it that that um that that can be something entirely natural you can be entirely yeah. good yeah in an entirely natural way that's not something yeah. enforced from outside mm. I mean, again, it's interesting, isn't it, that both in the, in the, in the musical tradition, probably in all art, artistic traditions, but particularly in music and, and similarly in, in Buddhism, you have to train really, really hard to get to that point. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's a strange thing I've often found with Buddhism that it's, you, you're, you're practicing, you're training very, very diligently, very consciously and in a way unremittingly so and nobody, nobody tells you this beforehand. You think it's all <laughs> candles and incense and, cha and chanting and yeah. loving kindness. And it is. There's lots of that. And, and, and it's lovely. Yeah. But there's, there's, hard, there's the hard graft. Yes, there's the effort. And, and then you get to the point where, you know, um, well, uh, you know, the, the, the Buddha has talked about as, you know, um, as expressing, you know, spontaneous compassionate activity. That's right. He meditated just a pure, pure responsiveness of his being to the being of another. That's right. I, I really, I really love. I came across recently uh, Sankaraksha, our founders, an early definition he gave of, of Buddhism. Oh. Uh, well, I'm sure it's one of many he gave, different ones he gave, and he made no claim. He, he was just describing it from for the purpose of the lecture he was giving at the time. This is way back in the early seventies, yeah. and he said. Uh, hope I can remember it properly. So Buddhism, we may say, is the develop, what Buddhism is about, or what Buddhism strives for, is the fullest possible awareness. Oh, uh, right, yeah. Just, and, and he made just, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And then he, he qualified it just very, very simply. He said, and this awareness, the, is the fullest or the deepest, the deepest possible awareness. Mm -hmm. and this awareness, we may say, has two principal aspects. The aspect of wisdom and the aspect of compassion. Oh, right. okay. uh, the idea being that the awareness that the Buddha's enlightenment mm. finds expression or overflows mm. as understanding, as wisdom, perception at, at that level, mm. and as compassion. Mm. I, lo I love that. I love that. And, and, and it's that idea of ease. It just yeah, it flows that way. Yeah. I mean, I remember you talking about that when we were 
preparing for this conversation a couple of days ago, I remember you saying, please ask me about that. That's really important. That awareness is really, really super important. So yeah, yeah, well, I think, I think if, if you were to find, try to find the, the link between art and art in the Western tradition, because art in the Western tradition, we might come on to that, is, is quite different from art in the Buddhist tradition. Mm. Um, it, the, the link has to be in terms of, of awareness. Mm. Uh, what, what music, literature, painting, the rest at, at the highest level in the Western tradition has to be about or how it's most usefully understood, mm. shall we say, the way I find it useful yeah. to understand it, is about refining awareness. So how, how, do you, how do you think that would apply, you know, you are talking about Placido Domingo a moment ago and his artistry, his, the skill that he'd acquired through his training, and how, how, would you, how would you see that applying to this notion of awareness in, in his? I, I think I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of the recipient of, of Domingo's art. Um, that the exposure to all the nuance in his singing, uh, to all the nuance in the music as written for him and the orchestra, the artistry of the players, the artistry of, of the conductor, that all, all in, in grappling with that nuance, that refinement of expression, we refine ourselves. Right. right. Yeah. Um, You're talking about... And, I, and that's, that's where the parallel is, comes through for me. Okay. <clears throat> so you're talking about you as a, as a, as a Buddhist practitioner as a meditator and, and, and also somebody who listens to music and, and where, and where the yeah. activity is between those two activities? Yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I think when, when I, I came to Buddhism quite late in life, I, um, I was, um, if it's very roughly speaking, 15, you know, I was over 50, uh, well over 50 when I, when I encountered Buddhism or committed to it. Mm. And, um, and, you know, I really envy you and people like you who had the benefit of it from an early stage. I would love to have been a Buddhist and I would bring up my son, you know. And I, yeah. But that, that, these things. Um, one of the little consolations, and I've been helped in this by... Uh, by people who can name me. Um, sorry, I said you can name names if you want. Uh, Vajrasura, yeah. and one of the ways in which Vajrasura, my preceptor, has been very helpful to me, uh, was in opening me to considering that experience of the arts might have given me a leg up that I wasn't beginning from scratch fifteen years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That a, a little bit of the work had been done, a little bit of the changing that needed to be undertaken had. And can you say more about that? to happen. You know, looking back, what was that? What was that work? What was that change that that that, that came about as, as a result of your engagement, your listening, your reading, your looking? Um, I can. I can. I would. Have, I would have been so completely unconscious of it at the time. Uh, that I can't, I can't say in terms of my music listening life um, that I was aware at any stage that it had changed me. But looking back, can you, can you say? Yeah. Uh, no, all I, can, all I can remember is that I was able to listen to music or see paintings or read books that would have been beyond me before. So I could see... Oh, so you, 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 you kind of get a sense, that sense that you get sometimes with maybe reading a poem that previously had baffled you. Yeah, the, 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 I can see progress in that way. What but I can, I can, sorry? You, you, you know, you, that sense of you're reading something, maybe for the second or third time, and, and you start getting a feeling for what it's trying to communicate, whereas before you didn't understand. Yeah, yeah and, that's, and that would be the experience of, of everyone who 
makes an effort to to get to grips with the art, wouldn't with the arts, wouldn't it? Um, I'd, yeah, probably. I mean, it's hard to generalise, but it, I mean, it, yeah. it, I mean, it's interesting that you say make an effort. You know, which which yeah. which, in itself, yeah. which in itself is a kind of like a um, that's an approach, isn't it? It's an attitude to art that it's something that is to be investigated. That you have to apply yourself to it for its riches to to reveal themselves. Yeah, and hopefully that is driven by uh, something like um, Haryapala was talking earlier briefly about um, about the eros, the right. spark, yeah. the um, what is it, the uh, moment of delight, the the sense, the the source of your of one's own delight, the, the ultimate in oneself, reaching out to the ultimate. Of, out there. When you say that's what that's what was happening when you when you heard the, that Beethoven sonata as a boy. Well, I, I I can I can tell it that way now. I can put that narrative on it now, and I like to, yeah. as you can see. <laughs> um, and uh, that's that's all I can say. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's that is how it appears to me now, mm. having learned this language for describing that kind of experience, having learned from Buddhism this yeah. language. Here's a question for you. Have you have you ever, you know, like I remember when I first discovered mushrooms. Hitherto, I thought they were disgusting, and then I discovered they're actually very tasty things. And I've had moments with music like that of all of a sudden, was, oh, that's what this is about. I've been averse to it, and then and then suddenly realizing that there was something in it that I was missing, and being really delighted by that. Away. Yes. Of a new, have you yeah. had that? Have you had that kind of experience with music? Oh no, no, that that is basic for me. That's the basic experience of music, yeah. um, uh, because uh, because I came to it as a, as a complete. Um, I'm not tone deaf. Yeah, I'm not tone deaf, but I have no musical, no natural musical facility. Mm. Uh, because, because of circumstances, because yeah. no one in the house could sing when I was growing up. Yeah. I was the oldest, my father and mother couldn't sing. Mm. Interestingly, my younger brothers and sisters, the younger, as, we, as you go down, yeah. they, they get more musical. That was your influence? A little bit, yeah. I, I was buying Beatles records, bringing them home. My yeah. brother was listening to them, you know, it was, yeah, there was more music being heard as, as the years went by. Mm. Uh, so, so for me, the basic experience of music, and actually the appeal of it, is is going hard at something, knowing there's something to be had here, and it emerging. And, it, and if, if, what are you working on at the moment? Musically. Yeah, in that in that in that way. Um, I have a, a brother-in-law, uh, a, a dear friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, and. He is a great enthusiast for new music oh. and for, well, Stockhausen isn't quite new music. He's second half of the 20th century, mm. but it's pretty far out, you'll agree. And this is um, European kind of concert music, should we call it? Uh, yes, uh, a lot of electronic yeah. uh, sound involved. Mm. Uh, I, I do find it hugely appealing. I don't find it difficult music at all. He's quite a difficult man. His, his, um, his thinking is very difficult. I think his music is a lot easier than his thinking, but his music is quite challenging too. He's written seven operas, one for each day of the week. Mm. And Steve, my brother-in-law and I, they're very rarely performed because they are reckoned to be in part, and some of them in, in their entirety, unperformable. Uh, but it's in the nature of music and opera houses that people are trying. Mm. So bit by bit, it's it's coming together. And Steve and I, we are of an age, more or less. He's a year younger than me, I think. Um, Steve and I have vowed to see all seven wow. while we are still capable oh. of it. Uh, this requires the opera houses of the world to get their act together, you understand, and perform the things. And so far, we are... Probably, we've seen extracts, so it's hard to calculate. But I reckon we're about three days in. Okay, right. Yeah. And and uh, and, and how was it? Because you you are deliberately entering into a world which is not going to be comfy, a comfy easy chair. 
Yeah. Well, if I tell you that, as you know, you know, I'm sure that uh, the most notorious piece of Stockhausen's music is the Helicopter String Quartet, tell us in about which uh, two violins, viola and cello, as in a standard string quartet, in a concert hall, uh, in four separate helicopters. Ah, okay. Not, not in a concert hall. Right. Right. But on on launch pads. At the, outside the concert hall. Okay. Uh, there are cameras in the cameras and microphones in the helicopters, mm. relaying the sound to the audience mm. in the concert hall, mm. and uh, the rotors start up, and the microphones give you a balance between a carefully uh, calibrated balance between the sound of the <laughs> of the rotors and the cellist or violinist sawing away bum, 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 bum. Mm -hmm. and uh, the helicopters take off fly to the four points of the compass mm -hmm. around in circles for about 25 minutes mm -hmm. I suppose and land again it is the piece is a byword for modernist self-indulgence mm -hmm. in art yeah it's totally over the top, and it is absolutely magnificent. I've seen it twice. When you say you've seen it, you were sitting in the concert hall listening to this over the PA? Yeah, the, the pilots, uh, the, the string quartet come in to the hall, oh. they say hello to us all, they are interviewed, they speak to the audience, they go outside, they get in the helicopters, and, what? Go on, and we listen, and, and they come back. And I can't, it, it is absolutely wonderful, mm. I can't, tell you why it's wonderful except to say that it seems to be to say something about things that start relatively small and become very very large wow. and become very very small and ordinary and literally come back down to earth yeah again and four very ordinary people come back into the hall, mm. accompanied by the pilots, mm. who are normally very ordinary mm. blokes, uh, who have developed a relationship with the musicians, which comes across when they talk to the audience, when they come back. And there's, there's a, it occurs to me now, there's a little parallel between that and looking at Placido Domingo, yeah, and yeah. saying, there is all that. Mm. You know, you, you've just sung Otello from beginning, Verdi's Otello from beginning to end, and, and here you are, you know, sipping a glass of wine and talking to a bloke from Irish radio. I mean, just a, a guy, you know. Uh, and and do, you th do you think there's something in that about, about our nature as human beings? We are, we're kind of ordinary and we've got these different dimensions. Yeah. And somehow through art, through religion, we can, we can participate in those deeper dimensions, both individually and with each other. So that's it. You've got it. We don't need to talk anymore. That's, <laughs> that's it. You, we've, we've done it. We've got, we've got the love of it. Yeah. Isn't that it? Isn't it? Well, it's, it, yeah, it is a strange, um, well, I suppose it's just part of being human, isn't it? Having these different, I mean, I, I you know, like, I mean, it was interesting working on this. I've been, I've been doing two things tonight, this, this conversation, the other interview, and I've been thinking about it all day at the same time, you know, needing to eat and needing to, shop for food and needing to you know chuck a few things in the skip outside because the next door neighbor's got a skip and if i don't do that today then i won't get a chance to chuck those things out that have been hanging around for years yeah. and at the same time you know I'm, I'm thinking about you know what's the relationship between yeah. black metal or death metal and buddhism or you know mozart and buddhism or four people in helicopters playing um Stockhausen. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I sometimes get impatient with musicians, and I feel entitled to as a non musician, mm. uh, because for, for, for not making sufficiently big claims, for not actually realizing, not so, sounding as though they realize what they've got, uh, what they're sitting on. Yeah. Um, because it is, as you say, that in art and religion, are in, in their origin, certainly, they certainly started out uh, as one and the same. Mm. Uh, a, a man 
going deep down into a cave in Spain or in France or, or wherever, or in New Zealand for that matter, and, um, and making down into the dark where there was no uh, natural light mm. and making abstract shapes or figurative shapes mm. on a rock uh, which could only be seen by other people with great difficulty and in the same torchless conditions, um, reaching towards towards what? To, 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 to all you, the only way you can understand what he was doing is that he was trying to be something more than what he was up, up above and the people who would come down with him to look at that would together be something more we, we, than what they not than how they normally saw themselves. Yeah, yeah. I've just, you, 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 we've got a little prepared piece, don't we? Well, you have. We were talking earlier about Mozart. I asked you what you was, was one of your particular interests or loves, and you, we got talking about the, the play Amadeus, which was made into a film in the 1980s, and a particular scene in that play. We were, talk, we were talking about, as, as I recall, we were talking about, um, I suppose, in, in a way, about, about the point at which art, art sort of becomes detached from religion. That's right, yeah. there, there's this, the, and, and in the West, that's really what's happened, uh, I think, because one of the, re the reasons, the very reason that Western art is so rich, and we should never apologize for it, Western art is, is a great achievement of humanity. Uh, one of the reasons it is, is that it's, it's had to take on the religious function with, with the, the so-called death of God and, and, and so on. Uh, some, uh, and before that, it's, is it the, I'm not sure, is it the Renaissance and the rise of humanism, the belief in man as opposed, you know, from, yeah, from, from, from the Renaissance onwards, the belief in man as the center of the universe mm -hmm. rather than the the other as, yeah. as the bow as it shifts yeah. that way um uh, so uh someone say, say mozart enlightenment 18th century 18th century composer uh you, you don't have the feeling that mozart i don't anyway mm. uh, that mozart is very pious mm. or religious in any in the way that the Western tradition understands religion. Uh, you've, you've got uh, composers, atheist composers who write masses. How does that happen? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Verdi Requiem, uh, Brahms, German Requiem. Mm. Uh, they, uh, so, so it, it appears that art and belief have, drifted apart. Mm. And the reason we were, I was quoting, the reason I was quoting this play, Peter Schaffer's play, yeah. Amadeus, is that Schaffer, I thought, very cleverly restored the link. Right. In, in a play called Amadeus, which was made into a, a famous film at the time, around, around the time you were five, I think, uh, Miwash Foreman directed it. <laughs> and uh, in it, uh, Salieri, who is Mozart's rival at the court in Vienna. Senior composer, uh, very well respected throughout the emperor, the emperor's musical right-hand man, uh, reckoned to be the finest musician in the city, encounters this whippersnapper child prodigy, Mozart, who in the play, most unfair to the historical Mozart, is depicted as, as gross, vulgar, horrible, horrible, tedious creature. And he hears Mozart's uh, serenade for wind instruments being played. Salieri does. And has this wonderful speech he addresses to God, mm. asking God why, how, genius has been given to that thing rather than to himself mm. and he talks about the religious what i would call mm. the religious element in mozart's music mm. in terms of need 
in terms of the law. And anyone who's listened to Mozart knows knows that 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 yearning, that yearning is there in slow movements, particularly. But once it, once you've seen uh, Amadeus, you hear it everywhere. It mm. seems to be what for me it's what, what Mozart is is about, I suppose. Uh, so Salieri's monologue. Apologies for the long introduction. If you could, um, Diasaga, if you can read it in front of you when you turn to the side. Okay, yeah. That, that's much better, yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, Salieri uh, addresses God, calls up in agony. What? What is this? Tell me, Signore, Lord. What is this pain? What is this need in the sound? Forever unfulfillable yet fulfilling him who hears it utterly. And he looks up to God and he says, your need, can it be yours? With a capital Y. Uh, mm. and, and yeah, but that, that's Mozart as the, as the cave painter in Lascaux. He's, he's mm. whether he probably didn't know it himself. Mm. Uh, or would not have put it in those terms, yeah. I think. But it is, it's addressing the need. And Western art can, you know, uh, the, the cultural background to Western art is very different to the cultural background to Buddhism. Mm. But there's, there's a meeting, I think, in between Western art and, and all, all religion. And, and no surprise, because Western art comes out of Western religion. Mm. Uh, in addressing the need, I suppose, but it, and which is neither Western nor Eastern, is it? It's a common human experience. It's universal, yeah, yeah. So it, 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 as you were talking there, that what what um, popped into my mind was the, there's a phrase from the Bodhicitta practice, this practice where you you generate the will to enlightenment for the sake of all beings. It's all about generating compassion, and in the in the traditional Tibetan text of it, it says something like, in order to um, alleviate the unbearable longing. I generate the unbearable longing to become a Buddha. It, I've, it's always really touched me. I didn't get that quite right, but it's got this phrase, unbearable longing. There's something about actually being willing to engage with that um, for oneself and for others. That there seems something very essential to both. Well, you know, like the religious, the religious life. I know religion is a word that we are uncomfortable with, but I think that. It points to something that you that, that is in Buddhism at least and in art that that it, that you, you, you can't quite capture in, in a neat concept. There's something religious about it, and um, yeah, to do with longing, to do with this hunger or thirst or need for something. And and the longing drives the effort. Yeah, 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 yeah. and somehow, but there's some. I mean, it's what, what's striking about that passage is there's something kind of um, maybe this comes out more in the in the film than the, than the uh, than the play. The, the way the way it's expressed, there's something kind of purifying or enlivening or, or uh, refreshing about about engaging with that, even though it's kind of slightly painful. So, uh, I remember Sangashura, um, who's a friend of ours, who plays in the Irish Chamber Orchestra. And he's got this favourite quote um, that one of his uh, visiting director of the orchestra had, which was um, they were playing, I can't remember what they were playing, but he said something like, the music has to have an element of pain in it to be beautiful. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of resonances with the Dharma in, in terms of actually just accepting in, in the sense of acknowledging the reality of Dukkha, the reality that there is this, uh, this seemingly unquenchable restlessness in our heart that needs some kind of expression or and some kind of witnessing as well. Pain doesn't pain also relate to uh, to change, to to the change that is implicit in the spiritual effort, uh, because it's it, it's nothing less than setting out to change what we are. Mm. We start here, Change. we are changing, changing ourselves into something else, mm. and that hurts. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that might be another definition between, or another distinction between, ah, oh, and I have to be very careful here, uh, 
between serious art and pseudo art. Mm. That if you are, or between a serious approach to art mm. uh, and, and a trivial approach to art. If you, if you approach the music of Wagner in order to uh, justify, uh, to glorify your regime, mm. or to justify going to war, mm. uh, you are making Wagner's art less than what it is. Mm. You're, li you're like uh, Paul Pott in, in Cambodia, making the Buddhist monks bless his soldiers before they went out to the killing fields to massacre other monks, probably. Um, but to appreciate uh, Wagner's music or any serious art, you have to open yourself to it and give up your notion of yourself, give up the idea that you are Yanadara or Dayasagara or uh, the master race or or the or the Irish people uh, yeah. you know if you if you just go go to art for confirmation of what you are or glorification of what you are yeah. uh, then you're not you you've missed the point you've missed the point you've got to go to it to allow it to wreak havoc to allow it to change you Mm. So that that's quite, so in a way you're talking about art there as a kind of disruptive, yeah, kind of influence, something that that disturbs the status quo, that disturbs, I don't know, complacency and ignorance. Mm. Yeah, and and that doesn't necessarily mean angry art. It, you know, it, it might it might all look the same. It might sound very gentle and very wonderful, but you approach it. Uh, we put a beautiful Mozart slow movement, one of those lovely longing slow movements. I was really struck when you were talking about Mozart because often Mozart is a kind of byword for sort of superficial prettiness. Yeah. You know? Um, it's funny that, that, that you, you can you hear him, you, you know, you know, on a light classical music uh, station, you, you'll hear Mozart. You won't, you maybe won't hear much of Wagner or maybe any at all. But yet yeah, you're talking about it as if it's got this, you know, deeper dimension. Yeah. Well, it's in, it's, it takes two to tango, doesn't it? I mean, the art is whatever the performer or the artist and the receiver of the art make of it. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. For me, anyway, that's, that's the only meaningful way to talk about it. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, I'm just aware, I'm, I'm aware that uh, about this time we were hoping to have a few questions. So if, if anything's been um, sparked off in your mind about anything that we've been talking about, um, you know, Dai Saga will be really happy to answer all your questions. <laughs> Thank you. So here's, here's, a one, here's one. Um, this is from uh, Amy. Any advice on how, to, on how to have drive and ambition for music without craving and comparison? How did you work through this? So what was the beginning of Amy's question, sorry? Any advice on how to have drive and ambition through music without craving and comparison? How did you work through this? I think this might be a question for me. Yeah, <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> um, well, I mean, in a way, um, hmm, that's a good question. I'm not sure I ever really got to grips with this because I kind of, I, you know, I, I got in, involved with music and then I got very heavily involved in um, Sri Ratna and the music kind of went slightly to the side. Um, I think I think the um, the thing that pops into my mind first of all is to um, remember what you're trying to do, which is create something beautiful. Uh, and and it's it's a little bit like what um, uh, Jai Sagar was saying there about our habit of of uh, appropriating. And I, th I think what can happen, I mean, it's interesting, um, Dai Sagara, that you, um, you talk about, you know, musicians being quite ordinary. I also know musicians who are really quite unusual and in some, some ways quite extreme characters. And I think some of that can come from, um, yeah, a, a kind of appropriation of music to one's own kind of sense of oneself. And that I'm doing this, not realizing that, you know, that 
you didn't you didn't create Mozart or whoever it is or Charlie Parker or, or you know that you're you know you're participating in something and if you and trying to remember that and 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 remember it's a little bit akin to in, in the in the in the Buddhist tradition you know the the, the in the Dhammapada it says one should pay no heed to the faults of others and what they have done and not done rather should one pay heed to one's own um, faults, what, you know, what one has done and not done. In other words, rejoicing in, in, in the beauty that you see in others and also being aware of your own propensity to, pro to appropriate. But it is really difficult, I think, with music when, to, 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 when you see something beautiful, when you see something, somebody who's just really brilliant and, and has got, you know, everybody in the palm of their hand, not to want a bit of that yourself. You know, it's a it's a real it's a hard practice, and you get it. You actually get it in 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 the, in the Dharma as well. You know, the same thing that you see somebody. I mean, I know people who have just got such an incredible grasp of the Dharma and are able to articulate it so beautifully, just so effortlessly, seemingly effortlessly. And you you kind of think, oh, I want some. <laughs> I want to be able to do that. Do you know what I mean? And and um, so I think I think just to rejoice and and, and to learn how to rejoice in that rather than trying to acquire it. That, that's my immediate response, Amen. But it's, it's, it's a hard one, yeah. But I think, I think there's a near enemy to that, which is trying not to have your ego involved or something. You know, if you're, gonna be, if you're gonna do anything wholeheartedly, you've gotta get your whole being behind it. And whether it's music, whether it's whatever it is, whether it's success in business, whether it's the Dharma, you've got to, you've got to be all there doing it. Um, but it's about serving something that's greater than you. Um, yeah. yeah. It's much easier to describe the point at which you arrive than to describe how you get there, isn't it? Um, yeah. Say again? It's much easier to describe the end result, the ideal, uh, the, the performer who has these qualities held in balance, yeah. the, the drive and the ego, uh, and the re re receptivity the openness to something greater than themselves. Yeah. The two, are, the two are in tension. Yeah. And, and, you know, like it's a messy business, like the, the Dharma is a messy business. And, you know, if, you, if you're going to live a genuine artistic life in the way that you just described it, it's, it could be torment. You know, people, people do suffer for their art. I mean, I know it's a, a cliche, but, you know, I mean, I think anyone, I, I mean, I remember, it, I mean, part of this talk was supposed to be about Becker, you know, this, I remember hearing this, um, the, the writer, um, Samuel Becker, the great Irish writer, somebody visiting him late, later in his life in, in his flat in Paris. And so I think it might have been Paul Astor, the, the novelist, and, and um, talking to Becker and saying um, about something that he'd written and um, how wonderful it was. And Becker said something like, um, oh, did you really think it was good? Like, it, like he didn't have this kind of confidence that that well I'm Samuel Beckett and everything I write is gold. I mean he's obviously a particular character, but a real sort of humility in the face of what he was involved with, and and not a sort of a um, you know a kind of cockiness about about his ability. Beckett incidentally would be absolutely appalled to hear us talking about him or even or suggesting that he uh, had anything to do with being a priest or a guru or a, guru right. or a figure of inspiration to lesser mortals like ourselves or to hear, to hear his art discussed in, in that way. Yeah, you, you, did, he, you did have a thing about, about the danger of killing art with reverence. Uh, yeah, well, he would he would certainly uh, res have resisted that um, to the point where the, the common view of his art is that it is nihilist, and and he he did everything to dissuade people from spotting redemption in his works, mm. uh, you know, spotting consolation. He did everything, uh, but I think. I, I think that if he succeeded in that, then it would no longer be art. I, I think uh, he did that because we are tempted to find to find redemption in 
in the in the artistic experience and we rush to definition of of that redemption we say we say ah, ah yes but Beckett's plays are beautiful so he oh, he holds on to an idea of beauty so beauty is there and he, he was constantly paring away at that but only in order to pare it down i think the beauty is left in in the simple confrontation with the the essential that he brings us to he it's not it's not that he's trying to eliminate the beautiful or eliminate the meaningful uh, or eliminate the redemption he's just re eliminating anything we could define or miss um and any spurious meaning we could attribute to that right right, right. yeah yeah so the kind of just the bareness of, of the what he's communicating the truth of what he's communicating yeah. Yeah, but he gives himself away sometimes. I was telling you about this the other day. He gives himself away. I saw, I saw his production of Waiting for Godot way back before anyone here was born in the 1970s. And uh, when the boy comes on in the first act and Vladimir and Estragon, uh, who have been waiting for Godot, um, question, Vladimir questions the boy and the boy says, um, Mr. Goddard says, he won't come today, but surely tomorrow, certainly tomorrow. Uh, in Beckett's own production, the boy was lit with a bright golden light and he had Botticelli ringlets. Mm. Uh, his hair was in Botticelli red, deep red ringlets. He had bare feet and his feet as if he'd been walking through the grass, through wet grass. His feet were pink, you know, and that. And what, you, no one in the theatre was in any doubt that something had come and gone. It wasn't what the two tramps had been waiting for, but yeah. something, something had come, something had gone. And Beckett's, through Beckett's plays, plays anyway, not just so sure about the prose. Mm -hmm. uh, every, now, every now and again in Beckett, shall we say, I think he gives himself away. This is a man who played Schubert. Yeah, right, yeah. 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 <laughs> this is, um, we've, just got, we've got another question here from... Oh, yeah, sorry. No, 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 no. Um, hi, Nyanadara. I hope you're well and happy. Um, not doing too badly. <laughs> Do you think one can get a bit too absorbed in, say, the beautiful music of Mozart and end up getting caught up in sensuality? So I think maybe maybe what you're referring to is in a way the Buddha cautioned against the in a way the dangers of the senses. Um, but I, one one of one of the, the teachings that I often bring to mind here is um, in the Satipatthana Sutta, where he's talking, the Buddha's talking about the four applications of mindfulness. These four spheres of things we can pay attention to: the body, um, feelings, uh, thoughts, and emotions, and you know. Dharma categories. And when he's talking about feeling or Vedana, the sense of things being pleasant, painful, or neutral, he talks about two different kinds of pleasure. He, uh, he talks about pleasure that's of the flesh and pleasure that's not of the flesh. So pleasure, the pleasures of the flesh, um, food, sex, sleep, and so on, are more likely to tend towards craving, whereas there's pleasure that doesn't tend towards craving, um, which can kind of lift you up, that inspires. And I think um, it, it is an interesting correlation here with, 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 with art and the way that we've been talking about it, that it can be something which is deeply pleasurable, but doesn't um, uh, lend itself towards a kind of hankering. Uh, it actually can communicate something true or something uh, about the nature of things. Um, because in a way, um, you know, the only way we can know, the only way we can hear about somebody else's perspective is through the, through, the community, through the senses, you know, to listen to the Buddha's words. We do that through the senses. And again and again um, in the Buddhist tradition, the, the Buddha's voice is talked about as being beautiful, um, that the Buddha, the, the people would want to listen to the Buddha, that, he, that they would be led towards his vision of things through the beauty of his speech. So I think, um, you know, there's always, I suppose, a danger of, of, of craving, of hankering, of spoiling, um, pleasurable experience by trying to grab a hold of it um but but i think it's possible to not do that with, with you know with with, with um with, with an ethical basis 
uh, with, with um, you know, spiritual training and so on. And um, yeah, anyway, that's, that's one response that I, I thought of. Maybe, maybe we've just got one, um, we've got one last question here, um, which maybe I could fire at you, Diasagra. Um, Max Richter talks about music providing a bridge between the known and the unknown. Does this resonate with you? Yeah, yeah. That, that's it, that's it. That's the spiritual path and, and that's music. We have wound up talking about music more than art, but it, it, yeah. it's the same more than other branches of art. Yeah. Um, but could you repeat the exact words again, Yanadara? Sorry. Max Richter talks about music providing a bridge between the known and the unknown. Does this resonate with you? Yeah. Yeah, that's. That was the sensation I had listening to the Moonlight Sonata, mm. aged 14 or whatever. Um, that he, it was something knowable. There is something, there was the definite, it's the sense of order in, uh, in Beethoven's music, that the sense of order is unmistakable. And yet, particularly in Beethoven, isn't it? The sense of that order being stretched to breaking point mm. and feeling your own desire for order and for your need, one's need to put order on the world uh, being at once tested and encouraged. Mm. So yes, yes, you're, you're starting out on, on the bridge taking your first steps on the bridge, but you've got a nasty feeling that the bridge maybe doesn't go. <laughs> you, may, you, may, you may go into thin air yeah, yeah. when you go out, and that's the sense of danger. You, yeah. You, yeah. Uh, if you're sure the bridge goes all the way across and you can toddle across, uh, something's not quite right. Yeah. Beethoven keeps you guessing. Yeah. Um, so, and that's why it's, so it's into the unknown. The unknown is, is thin, yeah. That I've, I've just, I'm just looking at the time and it, I think it's time to wrap up and maybe that's a good note to um, just to finish on. Um, so th thanks very much, Dice. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Um, uh, thanks everyone for bearing with us. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's always, it's always, it tends to be so personal, doesn't it? When you're talking about art and the arts, it's what floats one's particular boat and it, you know, so ho hopefully there's yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully there's something in that for the, those of you who are, who are with us that is kind of beyond the personal and is of some interest or benefit or um, pleasure. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've always thought it, it, I've never quite forgiven myself the, for the arrogance of, of daring to talk about it, really. Yeah. But, you know, someone has to do it. <laughs> true, it's true. So we'll leave it there just to let you know that we're, this is our last event for Culture Night 2020. Um, there's lots of other events coming up at the Dublin Buddha Centre. We'll have new courses on our website very soon. Um, so if you look at our website, dublinbuddhacentre.org, it'll have all the details of our events. And just to, just to mention as well that at the moment we're doing all of our uh, events, um, every single thing that we're running at the Dublin Buddha Centre, we're doing entirely on a donation basis. And um, yeah, we'd really encourage you if, you, if, you, if you'd like to, to just think about giving us a donation, that'd be much appreciated and just to enable us to keep doing what we're doing.